an interesting and varied group there, starting with uh, COVID-19 beyond the Cheltenham Festival. Right, we're going to get away with this this week, but for how much longer do we think there's a summit meeting tomorrow with sports industry leaders with government, something that's been in the pipeline for a little while? Not long, I don't think, Nick, to be honest. I think um, expediency, everyone not wanting to make the wrong move, be seen to be doing something, will mean that we'll be racing highly likely. I would have thought behind closed doors before too long. Personally, I just hope you're consistent. And if you're going to have sporting events behind closed doors, then you've got to do something about the train network and the tube network and everything like that, because otherwise sport is being held out to dry slightly. But you can understand that it will be, in the eyes of the wider public, a sensible precaution. I suppose they would have it that it's a necessity to, to travel on public transport for a lot of people to get to work and to go about their daily lives. It's not a necessity for a crowd to, to attend a sporting event. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we've got very vested interests here about you know the sporting events that are concerned. But international events in particular, we're talking about the Dubai World Cup, obviously looking to Euro 2020 and the Olympics further down the line, I think it'd be particularly difficult to, to host. And the objective just seems to be to slow it down at the moment, and that seems to be to reduce people contact. Um, uh, are you worried, Harry, or do you just try not to believe you can control the uncontrollable? Well, you can't control the uncontrollable, so um, you can't get worried about it. But, this, you know, it, it's situation's not getting any better, is it? And, um, you know, we use the word nightmare far too often, but this looks like, you know, it could be a bit of a nightmare. Um, you know, especially for, I don't know, about Aintree or Royal Ascot. But, um, you know, if things get progressively worse, then, you know, um, it, what is going to happen? Um, it is, worrying, isn't it? is there a possibility that, say, Aintree, Royal Ascot and moving beyond are run behind closed doors, that, that then we retrospectively look back and go, well, why did we let X many thousand people into Cheltenham for a week? Possibly, but of course if it goes on and on and on, you then might look back and think, well, why didn't we let more people into Aintree? And that's the problem, we just don't know where we're going to go with this. The worry is obviously once you draw a line in the sand and say that you're not going to hold events because there are X number of cases, we could be above that number of cases for absolutely months. Yes, um, and 17,000, I think, people now quarantined in Italy. It uh, continues to be a worry, and I don't imagine that that will disappear from these talking points for many, many months. Festival declaration time. So they're 48 hours now. People seem fairly happy with that. With the ground variables and options, others would probably prefer to go back to 24. Others would like there to be 72. We can get there right at the beginning of the week and we all know what runs and who rides what. Where are we at, Harry? What, should, what is the well, ideal? Think, what do you think? I think 72 is a bit extreme, but um, 40 hours, I think it's... A, I mean, you've got a fair idea of what the ground's going to be like in two days' time with the forecast and everything else. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just think that... Um, you know, you should really know where you're going to run um, at 48 hours and, um, you know, it makes it easier for options, you know, for various horses that are in two or three different races that, you know, trainers are going to, you know, be able to work out sooner where they're, where they're going to run their horses and I, I, I think it's a good idea. So you would be just in, you were in favour of as it is where it is? Yeah, 40, I think 48 hours is good, yeah. Harry, would you agree with that from a jockey's point of view? Does it make a lot of difference or not? It make, doesn't make any difference to me, but, um, you know, from, from a <clears throat> trainer's point of view, it seems to be working well, and I haven't had Paul say anything wrong about it, so, um, you know, it, it works well, so I think we should keep it the same. And what about something completely revolutionary, Richard? The, the weekend before, we know which horses are going to be declared for every single race at the meeting. Is that, is that, is that a goer, or is that...? No, I don't think it is, because I think the ground, as the ground difficulties as we, we go through the week would make it really quite, quite tricky. Um, personally, I would be in favour of 48 hour decks right across the board. I think it must be very difficult if you're in a mixed yard at the moment. You have half of them over 48 and half of them over 24. I think this sort of scenario pans out. I appreciate that horses can have setbacks close to individual races, but I think this strikes the right balance between giving the public sufficient time and sending the cards right around the world, which for Cheltenham is quite important. Mm. I think anything above that is reflective. You know, they have them in Hong Kong further in advance, but you don't get the ground variables and you don't get the, the number of races. So I think that might be one step too far. It definitely should be a reserve uh, system for handicaps where horses are coming out over 48 hours, uh, you know, at the end of the day. There should be opportunities for horses that are missing out by one or two to still get a run. I think that's important. Yeah, well, that's certainly something that can be said, and something that has been argued many, many mm. times. Let's talk about the per temps final. Um, the, uh, David Jennings in the Racing Post wrote a nice piece this week. It was an interesting piece, whether you agreed with it or not, about uh, the qualification for this system being a bit of a joke and horses 
uh, lights being hid under bushels because they're only going to finish in the first six and they qualify. Well, it's a lot better than it was uh-huh. when all you used to be able to do was enter the thing, and if it was abandoned, you got you got a free ticket in. Again, I'm going to slightly paraphrase this, but there was definitely a, an instant many years ago where Chepstow held a qualifier <laughs> and was virtually underwater at whatever the entry stage was in those days. And I'm sure Charlie Brooks entered his entire stable <laughs> for that race. <laughs> the funny bit being is that Chepstow then dried out significantly and passed the next couple of inspections <laughs> and eventually it was abandoned. But Charlie yeah. was have been slightly concerned about A, the amount he'd have to pay because he wouldn't get the money back and B, that he might have to run a few of them. So it's a lot easier than it used to be for yeah, sure. Yeah, just, just sneaking him into six is quite a difficult task for your average for your average jockey, I'd think, isn't it, Harry? Oh, well, we're always trying, so we, we don't do any sneaking. <laughs> the storyteller's artistic to be on belief in the Irish qualifier. Sixth. Sixth. Best sixth you've ever seen when your objective is to qualify. Is to, is to finish sixth. So, easy, all joking aside, for the in- integrity of the sport, would it be better to have a more robust qualifying system for this race? Um, well, I, you know, I, I suppose... I've, I've got a horse, Young Bull, who was entered in the Potemps final, and um, we missed out at Haydock because um, he trod on his toe clip on the way up there and couldn't run because he was lame. And he was in the Chepster one the following Saturday. I don't think we'd have run him this year anyway because um, he's a big chasing type, and um, you know we probably would have swerved it anyway. But had it been his main target, you know, uh, Chepster was abandoned the following week, and we wouldn't have been able to run. So, you know, I was ringing up Weatherby's on the morning of declarations for Chepstow, finding out whether because I didn't actually know. Uh, that if we um, declared and it was abandoned, do we automatically qualify? But obviously that ruling has been changed. So um, as it happens, I probably wouldn't have run him anyway. But, um, you know, it does seem a bit frustrating or unfair that, you know, I can't get him in the attempts if... uh, if, if that's the case. But. Can't make it too sanitised. Part of the fun is sorting, sorting, <laughs> sorting these horses out. If it's all too sanitised, they'll run on their merits. The favourite wins every race, it gets boring. And if Kilbrick and Storm is second <laughs> festival winner. <laughs> Um, the Racing League, you mentioned Charlie Brooks, that's a neat though possibly unintentional segue because Charlie's been one of the people behind uh, the Racing League, formerly called Championship Horse Racing, which has finally got its launch today uh, in conjunction with Sky at four tracks over six Thursday nights in the summer. So the fixtures are there, it's going to go ahead. It's not received universal acclaim. My sort of feel is your expectation bar is quite low now. Now go and jump over it and, and prove to everyone that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile event. Yeah, I think we've always felt that all team events, um, whether they be jockeys or whether they be you know, wider than that, it's a little bit square peg round hole with, with racing because there's no natural ability to get behind a certain... It's a problem with the 100, isn't it, you know, with the cricket? You're bringing together a diverse number of players, most of whom don't have any natural affiliation with that particular team, and that makes it hard to generate great belief in Team X or whatever you want to call them. And racing doesn't sort of fit that easily, so you're having to massage it, and I I don't know. I remain to be convinced, but I I wish them well with it. It's almost like a different sport, because, you know, part of racing is about ownership and you know, having your colours on that horse and, um, you know, it makes it more about the horse mm. and the owner and everything else. But um, this, I mean, you know, the Shergar Cup is, I mean, I enjoy my flat racing and watch all the top flat racing, but I can't buy into Shergar Cup at all. I, I just, I don't watch it. And, um, yeah, that, that now is considered to be a success, having had similar... Yeah, obviously I'm all for in- initiatives to get people into racing and obviously it has been a success in terms of getting people through the door and watching racing, which is great, but it just seems, um, you know, it seems sad that, you know, it's not, it becomes about the team and, and the jockeys rather than the horse and the ownership and everything else. So, um, yeah, it's, it, I just think it's, 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 sad that you know it, it, it takes it away from from the ownership and the, I think the welfare grounds make it difficult as well you know they if you go around the world watching Formula Ones they just pick up inanimate objects cars and plonk them down and you can race them every two or three weeks you just can't do that with horses some take longer to get over it so to get a following is very hard the other angle here of course and, and one that Rafe Beckett and others have come out against you at Williams is that the use of the whip will only be allowed for you know carrying but yeah, it's hands and heels essentially. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see how that, mm. you know, how that works. What definitely. impact that then yeah, has subsequently? Pick. That yeah. might be its yeah. biggest impact. Very actually. much so. Yeah, it might well be, and and it may well be partly a, a driver for the for the for the fixtures. George Rook is a uh, a jockey who has been riding through his claim 
but a bit quicker than he should have been because he had some winners in Jersey. Now that this is, he's had three winners in Jersey, didn't he? He did. Yeah. And because obviously your claim comes down with the amount of winners you've ridden, you know, and and the calculation has, has missed the three winners in Jersey. This has had some quite hefty knock-on effects. Yeah, I'm going to get on. With a soapbox a little bit and I know you you also wrote an article which prompted me to, to follow up some stuff so first of all it's not as easy as just disqualifying George Rook's last three winners because if you then go back I think he was claiming five when he should have been claiming three um, there was some qualification for races so you could only have ridden a certain number of winners which you then fall outside it is ridiculous that we cannot have a system in this day and age where so much of sport is built around statistics yes. that you and I cannot look up Harry can't look up easily how many, How many you winners you've had, and you know it, it, you don't know, do you? No, I can no. tell you. And you get to, you get to close to a thousand winner landmarks for people, and we only up asking Aidan Coleman, Sam Twist, and Davis. The BHA tried to put something in place, but it didn't work because it went back, didn't go back far enough their database. But it's absolutely ridiculous. I can watch the ladies' um, T20 final today and work out where um, Lisa Healy or someone mm. scores every single one of her runs. You know, and that's and yet for racing, I can't work out how many winners you've had. I mean, that's just ridiculous. But why should the responsibility be on? I mean, shouldn't there be an automated system that this stops this happening? I mean, you shouldn't have to be carrying around the responsibility of counting up your own winners, should you? It's BHA's job, isn't it? Yes, and they say it's the, they, the onus is on you if you would, as they say, if you weren't no broad to notify. Sure, clearly George didn't realise that and which jurisdictions, etc. It just is rather beyond the belief that in this day and age we can literally be talking about this sort of thing and the implication it has, because there will be lots of horses disqualified. I got a phone call from the BHA, we're also owned with um, uh, Chris Dixon, bedtime bellers, finished third at Pontefract, no idea why, but George has claimed the wrong amount, so we'll be an inquiry and we'll lose it. Now look, you know, you'll lose it, what were you, that, well, was, that represented a personal loss to you, about oh, £38.75, yeah, £38, won't but it? I wonder how many others there are in that, it's not as simple as the winners is basically what we're saying, and it's just bizarre. It is an oddity. Um, and one you fancy might hopefully didn't ride any in Jersey when you were younger, did you? No, I don't think so. <laughs> You're just safe then. I wouldn't declare them now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about the GVC. It's a big week for the GVC boss Kenny Alexander, the Ladbrokes Corals, of course, uh, parent company, because he's got Honeysuckle running in the Mayor's Hurdle, one of the clashes of the week with Benny De Dieu. But more significantly, on a, a global sense for the industry, uh, they've now come out and said there aren't quite as many shop closures as first they feared with the uh, rejigging of the media rights issue last year. Yeah, which has two implications. One will be reopening the prize money issue. Um, some of the trainers and the boycotts, etc., are saying it was going to be too pessimistic to go off too early, so maybe that will rear its head again. But I think the key point it's done for racing is it's moved racing away from this for profit. Yeah. You know, in terms of, it, clearly, the deal was built on the wrong model. Yes. Because it was a per shop a model. Per shop model. So, Absolutely. So Whereas now, you know, shops are closing all over the place. Now, the streaming aspect of, you know, bet and watch basically means that in theory it's more revenue based which was be a, a more solid way to base your system going forward but of course harry as you'll know a lot of horsemen or trainers are now saying well you massively over exaggerated the or massively exaggerated the uh, potential betting shop closure last year so uh, prize money was cut by all the race courses etc uh, and it was a vast overreaction do you have any sympathy with that view um well, it's something I don't know a huge amount about, but um, we were taken out for dinner by Newby Racecourse, a few of us trainers, and um, you know it was quite scary uh, learning about how much income comes from, you know, uh, betting shops. Uh, the, was it the SBP or whatever they call it? And um, you know, a, a large amount of their income was coming from off, uh, you know. Uh, or of course, um, betting shops. So, um, yeah, if this, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, it's, it's not something I know a huge amount about. But um, you know, at those uh, race tracks, you know, the, the prize money is very poor, and um, you know, if it doesn't get any better soon, then it probably is going to rear its head again. I think visibility is important as well. I think a lot of trainers' cases to be able to see that money flow and see who's getting what. Um, but I think it was just. A, they were just caught out by a, a change in legislation which had almost, an, um, from racing's point of view, an unconsidered impact and we've been struggling against that ever since really. Okay, that is uh, the GVC boss Kenny Alexander who this week said that uh, the impact of the fixed odds betting terminals may not be quite as significant as was first feared in terms of shop closures and therefore uh, the throughput or through flow of, uh, of money into the industry. Now, clearly, unless you have just 
landed from Mars, you'll know that Sheikh Mohammed has been a significant figure in the news this week, and not just in the, in the racing pages either. Uh, the front page of the Times yesterday was completely dominated, the Saturday Times, by a picture of uh, Sheikh Mohammed with Her Majesty the Queen, with the headline, Sheikh Mohammed's bitter family dispute revealed in High Court ruling. This was also featured in the Racing Post earlier this week. Uh, a title that Sheikh Mohammed established himself back in the 80s, and there is the front page of yesterday's Times, Queen shuns Dubai ruler, uh, suggesting the possible diplomatic implications of the family dispute between Sheikh Mohammed and his, uh, his wife, Princess Hira of Jordan, that has, has, has been played out in the, in the news this week. So it would be naive, Richard, wouldn't it, to believe that this is going to have no impact at all on the sport of horse racing because no, it already has had an impact in terms of racing's own links to, to, to this case. Absolutely, which as we know are, are extremely strong and on a different end of the spectrum if you like to be what's played out in the courts. So let's try and deal with various things in, in turn. First point is the reporting restrictions. Whenever you get reporting restrictions everybody's nearly always written their yeah. articles and so when they're released you get this absolute avalanche with everyone competing to break the story in a bigger way. Even, even in the news context of Corona virus this has made a, a splash because people have been sitting on the story for yeah, so long absolutely. we've known this has been in court for a long time so you're not quite sure whether the queen shuns is actually a, any official protocol that's been sort of sounded out prior to this or somebody just going one step ahead as regards what was pertinent from the from the court case we've just selected a couple of the the comments and i've just one from the judge he says that his rulings, and this was a civil case, so it was on the balance of probabilities, not beyond reasonable doubt, may well involve findings, albeit on a civil standard, of behaviour which is contrary to the criminal law of England and Wales, international law, international maritime law, and internationally accepted human rights norms. So that's where the issue on his ruling becomes central to the registered owner, fit and proper persons test, etc., for the BHA. Indeed. And the, the BHA have um, a system in place by which they can refuse to accept anybody, essentially, as a, as a fit and proper person if they don't meet the criteria concerned. And it's quite broad, the, yes, the, it's the, not, this as well. Yes, it is, although it's not widely implemented. As you no. say, you get the impression they're giving themselves wriggle room for exactly. when it suits, but when it doesn't, there is enough um, vagueness, if you like, in its implementation. So, again, just a couple of pieces from the owner registration guidelines from the BHA's own site. A person whose conduct, behaviour or character is not in accordance with that which, in the opinion of the authority, should be expected of a registered person may or may not be considered suitable and therefore refused registration. So that's your wide version. The key sub-paragraph, if you like, it's fun reading all these, 10C, whether the applicant has been the subject of any adverse findings by judging any civil, civil proceedings relating to any matter which could reasonably said to materially affect his or her suitability to be registered an owner. And you'd have to say, under uh, that yeah. particular guideline, it's enough for it to be looked at. Uh, the issue, of course, here is that we're not just talking about Joe Bloggs, we're talking about a head of state who clearly has a, a degree of Im diplomatic immunity on a grander scale, never mind within the confines of horse racing. And if the Foreign Office aren't going to make a comment, then you can quite understand why the BHA aren't going to make a comment. And it's not really for us to comment any more than to say, what are the implications going to be going forward for horse racing and the involvement of someone who's been such a key and pivotal figure in the sport for so many decades? Yes, yeah, so we're looking at the number of runners that have been had. They're actually slightly down on previous years, but you were talking of upwards of 1,500 runners. They're split largely, actually not amongst that too many trainers. Charlie Appleby and Saeed Binsa are obviously the main two, few scattered around in Ireland. I wonder who the onus is going to be. Is it going to be how Sheikh Mohammed views the Britain. way that, that yes, yeah. Britain basically, and, and, and the, the release... judge is ruling that, that, that this can be private information can be released publicly, and that's the main concern. They haven't been talking about ruling. It's been the fact that it was made put into the public domain. Now, does that mean he will try and move his assets to elsewhere? Can he? Can he with this huge stud operation, or will he just move on and dare, if you like, the BHA to do something? Because I think. History suggests that they're unlikely to do so, given there are other heads of state, some of whom have been associated with actual yeah. internationally proven war crimes. And I, I think when you're talking about people at that level in their, own, in, their, in their own country, if the government takes a position or Foreign Office takes a position, the BHA have to kind of follow in behind. It's very difficult for them to, to take some sort of position over and above that. Yeah, there'll be plenty reading the headlines who feel it's so abhorrent that the BHA should take a stance, but I think that is possibly 
uh, not, doesn't reflect the way these things pan out. And that's not to make an apology for the BHA. It is just pragmatism in these diplomatic circumstances tends to win the day. And uh, there will be some discussions going on as to how that can be tactically, tactfully approached, I think. And a lot of people have said that everybody in the sport is in some way connected or uh, not on the payroll, but has 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 something that they owe to, to Shane Manahaman and Gadolfin. And that and that is essentially true. I mean, in, in almost every case, whether you're doing our jobs, doing Harry's job, doing Harry's job, Harry's job everyone has been touched by the involvement that that this man has had in the sport since 1976. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you remember people would have credited him with the, the saviour of the sport through the 80s and mm. 90s when things were really struggling. Kept you it on to, TV. You go to Newmarket, you know, trade papers. Mm. Um, but of course that does make it very difficult because everyone does have vested interests and people will interpret any inaction mm. as being, well, they would say that, they're on the payroll or they're on this, that and the other, but it's very difficult actually to find anyone who wouldn't be hypocritical <laughs> in those circumstances. It touches everyone and will continue to do so. Uh, it's a very tricky one, but I think it's one that, if you like, at the moment is right on every front page because of those restrictions. I think it will fade into the background yes. over time and I actually don't think we'll see a great deal of change. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm not going to pass comment, I don't know, but I don't think it will be the cataclysm that this morning's papers and yesterday's papers make it suggest. Yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to agree with you. Those were this week's Talking Points. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.